in this temple we are in the process uh, of reading and listening to and contemplating the great extensive Buddha flower adornment scripture. We started this study project, this great adventure, a few months ago. There are many causes and conditions for the uh, embarking on this exploration of this great scripture. One of them is that this scripture has a, to some extent, not sufficiently acknowledged influence on what we sometimes call the Zen tradition. This sutra has a very deep influence on the Zen tradition, starting in China and then spreading to Korea and Japan and other places like North America. This, this scripture uh, rather quietly has influenced the tradition for around 1,600 years, which is about when the sutra came together. One of the hallmarks of Chinese Zen in a particular lineage which comes down to us through the ancestor Dogen in Japan. But one of, the, one of the main teachings of that school is the interpenetration of universal and particular. Of one and many of principle and phenomena. That's a kind of a hallmark of the particular lineage of this temple in China. But the sutra is not that, it, that, this, that this teaching was so vastly uh, given is not mentioned too much. And so I want to pay homage and praise and make offerings to this great sutra and the many teachings which are at the core of our practice. One of them being that because the infinite and the particular are so intimately engaged with each other, so intimately include each other, that gives rise to the emphasis or the acknowledgement of the importance to do every tiny act with complete attention to the tininess. Minute attention to the details of our day-to-day, -day, moment by moment life, to our thinking, our speaking, our gestures, each one of these things in their kind of subatomic manifestation includes the whole universe. And therefore, everything deserves the attention that the whole universe deserves. And these particulars give us a chance to celebrate this mutual inclusion, this great mutual inclusion of everything and everything, of each particular and the vast reality of the universe. That's one of the main things that this sutra influenced us in our tradition. If we continue this study, more 
influences will be revealed. One of the founding teachers of Zen Center, named Dainin Katagiri Roshi, uh, when I came to Zen Center, he was kind of like Suzuki Roshi's assistant. So I don't want to skip over this story, which seems to be calling for me to tell you. (laughs) I wasn't planning on, but here it is. So I went to Zen Center in San Francisco uh, in December of 1967. I had previously gone to Zen Center at Tassajara, Zen Mountain Center, in the summer of 1967. And uh, I didn't like the place very much. I didn't like the way it smelled, (laughs) the sulfur springs. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like being inundated by by flies, biting flies, and mucus flies that go into your nose and ears. I I was not comfortable being there. I thought it was beautiful, but I didn't didn't like it. After I left, I thought... Sometime after I left, I thought, maybe I'll go live there. (laughs) Things change. And then that led me to come back to Zen Center again, this time to the San Francisco Zen Center Temple, which was on Bush Street at that time. It was the San Francisco Zen Center uh, cohabited a temple called Sokoji, with a, uh, an, uh, what do you call it, and a great assembly of Japanese Americans. So Caucasian or uh, European and African Americans started to infiltrate, infiltrate the, uh, the community there in this temple. So Suzuki Roshi was there, and Katagiri Roshi was there. Suzuki Roshi and Katagiri Roshi were not Japanese Americans, really, at that time. Maybe they were becoming American, but they're Japanese from Japan, and they came to give us a gift. So I went to Zen Center during, in, during the day uh, to see about practicing at the Zen Center. And the address I was given of the Zen Center was 1881 Bush Street. So I went to 1881 Bush Street. And I knocked on the door. And uh, an elderly Japanese man opened the door. Um, and uh, I didn't, I don't think, I don't remember saying, can I come in? I think he just opened the door and, and gestures I could come in. So I went in. And, uh, and I think maybe they gestured that I could sit down. So I sat down. And in the room where I sat, there were quite a few other kind of elderly Japanese men. I don't know, maybe there were 20, maybe there were 30, and they were smoking cigarettes, and they and they were playing Go, the Japanese, the, the Asian, the Chinese, Japanese, Asian game of Go. They are playing Go. And I thought, well, this is kind of surprising. Here's the Zen Center. It's elderly Japanese men smoking, uh, Japanese-American men smoking, and uh, playing Go. So I sat there for quite a while watching them play Go. I don't remember how long, you know, 
quite a while. Ten seconds is pretty long, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but it took me longer. To just, it, I'm not very fast. I'm kind of slow-witted. <laughs> Excuse me. But that's what you got here. <laughs> kind of a slow-witted guy from the middle of the country, comes to San Francisco, walks into this room, which he thinks is a Zen center, but little by little, it occurs to this guy, maybe this is not the Zen center. <laughs> so I said to one of the very nice people, they let me in the room, <laughs> let me sit there and watch them play. I said to one of these nice people, is this a Zen Center? And he said, no. The Zen Center is next door. <laughs> so there's 1881A and 1881B. I think I went to B. He said it's next door. So then I went down the hill 50 feet and knocked on another door that said 1881A. Knock, knock. And the door opened, and there was a young man, kind of relatively young man, in the prime of life. He looked like he was about 38. And he had a shaved head, and he wasn't smoking cigarettes. And he was wearing robes, dark robes, which I knew enough about Zen to know that Zen monks sometimes wear dark robes and have shaved heads. And I thought I was going to the Zen Center to meet the teacher, Suzuki Roshi. I thought that the person who opened the door was Suzuki Roshi. Seemed reasonable to me. Again, rather slow-witted, right? <laughs> I had heard that Suzuki Roshi was about 62 years old at that time. And I thought, and this guy looks like he was 38, right? I thought, wow, this Zen's really great. <laughs> a 62-year-old man looks like this. Wow. I like this Suzuki Roshi. And I said, I've come to see if I can like, join the practice here. And he said, OK, please come in. And he took me into an office, right? <coughs> As you come in the door, there was to the right, excuse me, to the left, there was an office. And to the right, there was a stairway going up, going up, to, going up to the next floor. But he invited me into this office. And he said, maybe you could meet the president of Zen Center and talk to him about becoming a practitioner here. I said, OK. So he brought me into another room and offered me a seat to sit. And I sat, and he sat, went back and sat at his desk. And I watched him try to do some clerical work that he was doing. Maybe he, maybe he wasn't clerical work. Maybe he was writing notes for a, a talk. But probably not on the Avatam Saka Sutra. <laughs> probably not in the Flower Dormant Scripture. I, di I didn't say, what are you writing? Again, not very inquisitive, kind of dull-witted. <laughs> just sit there watching this guy writing at his desk. <laughs> but I could see, even though I'm kind of dull-witted, I could see that this person who was writing was very tired, and he kept falling forward, not quite hitting his head on his desk. <laughs> very tired, like writing and then nodding, writing and nodding, <laughs> writing and nodding. But he kept persevering with his writing. He didn't say, excuse me, i got to go lie down. <laughs> He kept writing. I thought, he's sleepy, but he's really diligent. Keeps trying. He's having trouble sitting up. I still think maybe this is Suzuki Roshi. And I'm having kind of an intimate meeting with him. Uh, anyway, he called the president of Zen Center and told him that I was here to discuss becoming a member of the practitioner community. And then after not too long, <laughs> the president came, and we went off to our meeting. And um, yeah. 
And the president was my dear friend, my dear Dharma, older brother, Silas Holdley. Mm. Mm. Silas Holdley. Homage to Silas Holdley. Very wonderful Zen student and very kind to me. He took me over to his apartment, which is across the street. We went up into his apartment and to have a meeting. And he also said, please have a seat. So I did. I sat down on a chair, and I went right through the chair. <laughs> and he said, you must be rather dense. <laughs> so I've told you that I am rather dense mentally, but I'm also dense physically. So I'm heavy, dense, kind of dull person, <laughs> which you may have no, may be noticing right now how, how dull I am. So even though I'm dull, I'm also radiant, right? <laughs> radiant dullness. <laughs> and that's part of the teaching for today, is the teaching of radiance. Radiance. Luminosity. Brightness. Light. This sutra is about radiance. This sutra is about illumination. This sutra is about Buddha's radiance. And it influenced the Zen school quietly. So this sutra is one of the ways we will discover that Zen practice is really to be absorbed and concentrated and open and at peace with radiance. Now, where did the story I just told you come from? I don't know. But one place it might have come from is a story which Katagiri Roshi told me later. So I was going to tell you the story about that Katagiri Roshi told me, but I thought I might also just tell you something about Katagiri Roshi well, before I tell you the story. Are you ready for the story? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So one day he said to me that, um, well, I knew I knew that he had. He grown up in a small temple, and he, with a one with one teacher. There was just him and his teacher living in this small, rather poor, Zen temple. But they did have some food, which he appreciated. And then he left his small temple, and went to the big temple, the huge temple called Eheji. He went to that temple, where there's many many monks and more food. <laughs> and he had the opportunity to be the close attendant to the, one of the main teachers of this huge monastery. And that teacher's was, name was Hashimoto Eko Roshi. So he was his attendant for, I think, quite a few years. And being so close to the teacher, he got, um, he got a lot of opportunities to listen to this teacher tell people teach people about our practice, which we call sometimes Zen meditation, or Zazen, or just sitting. So being with this great teacher, he learned a little bit about the infinite magnificence and greatness of our practice. He learned how great just sitting is. That teacher told him, taught him about that. That teacher brought the light of this sutra, without mentioning it maybe, brought the light of the flower adornment, ocean of worlds, treasure house, to the monks and showed the monks how great this simple practice we do is.
And that's also what I'm offering, is to bring this sutra to you and use this sutra to help us understand how great this simple, little, tiny, tiny, tiny practice of me sitting and you sitting, this tiny little person in this huge universe, this tiny little particle of a sitting includes the whole universe and is included in all aspects of the universe. So again, why did I bring up Katagiri Roshi? Because he grew up in a tiny little temple. Grew up means from being a young man until he went to Eheji. And being at Eheji for quite a while and learning a little bit about the infinite practice of the Buddha, which we express in our daily sitting. He went back home to visit his teacher. This is why I'm bringing it up. And he said to his teacher, why didn't you tell me how great Zazen was? And his teacher said, you didn't ask. (laughs) (laughs) So I want to, um, I bring that up because part of receiving the light of the greatness of our practice is to ask for it. The light's coming all the time, everywhere. But if we don't ask for it, we might say, why didn't you tell me about it? And if we say, why didn't you tell me about it? Maybe the teacher, the Buddha said, you didn't ask. Matter of fact, not only didn't you ask, but I was happy to offer it to you, but this light, this magnificence of our practice maybe is not appropriate unless people ask for it. So... In the sutra, there's a lot of people, you know, of various kinds of people. Some of the people are not humans. Many, many, many tremendous diversity are in this sutra at the very first page surrounding this magnificent thing called Buddhahood. Buddhahood is realized on the first page of the sutra. It's realized for the first time on the first page, and there's an immense congregation present, witnessing, celebrating this great event of perfect awakening. And the first chapter is a presentation, an offering of all the different types of beings that there are in this assembly. And for each type of being, there's 10 great leaders of each type. And each of the 10 great leaders, by the power of this awakening, they can see the Buddha and they can praise the Buddha. And they do. So I think there's like maybe 58 different types of beings there. And each type of being has like 10 leaders. And each of the 10 leaders has a a primary leader. And each of the primary leaders tells us what, what each of the 10 leaders knows. So that's like approximately 10. And each of the 10 leaders has these 10 visions of the Buddha. So that's like... Uh, maybe 580 visions of the Buddha in the first chapter. Each vision is conveyed in a four <laughs> in a four line verse. So uh, here we are in the big in the first first book. 
we had this immense, magnificent, virtually infinite assembly. And each of the types has a group of 10 leaders, and one of the 10 leaders tells us what the other 10 leaders can see or understand about the Buddha. And so we get to hear all, all that they see of the Buddha, and they can see the Buddha by the power of the Buddha who they're with. So the Buddha empowers these people to tell the whole universe, including us, about the Buddha. The Buddha doesn't say, doesn't talk about the Buddha. This Buddha who had just woken up does not talk about Buddha. But this Buddha empowers the whole assembly to talk about the Buddha, to tell us about the Buddha. In particular, they often telling us about the body of the Buddha. This is the first book. And the first verse in the sutra, and the first book, yeah, period, is this. It's about the Buddha's body. The first verse, which the leader of the first group is telling us about, is that the body of Buddha extends throughout all the great assemblies. That's the first verse about the Buddha, body. It extends throughout all the great assemblies. So, for example, this is one great assembly. The body of Buddha extends throughout every person in this assembly, but also to every subatomic particle of each person to all the molecules of this person, to the DNA of this person. The, the, ex, the extension or permeation of our bodies and minds by the Buddha is the Buddha's body. And not just the people here, but the people back in India when this sutra was written, the people in China, the people in Japan, from the infinite time since Buddha was awakened till now, the Buddha's body has been pervading everybody in all the assemblies. That's the first line of the first verse of the sutra. Second line is, it, what's it? This is a test, what's it? Buddha's body, it fills the Dharma realm. It is quiet. It is free of any nature, including Buddha nature. And it appears, it appears for the sake of the world. Oh, I forgot. It is quiet. It is free of any nature. And it's ungraspable. The Buddha body is ungraspable. Because it's ungraspable, it can pervade us completely. There's no hindrance to the Buddha body. That's the first verse of this sutra. And that, I would say, is at the heart of Zen. Everything about us is pervaded by this Buddha body. And then, the, and then, what are some 579 more verses celebrate the Buddha? Okay, that's the first chapter, which is setting up what I want to talk about today. And also coming from what I already told you. At the end of the first book, these innumerable beings, and in particular, I think, the bodhisattvas in this assembly, they make uh, the ocean, the ocean of worlds of bodhisattvas in this assembly. 
they make clouds of offering. So from the ocean of these great enlightening beings comes these clouds of offering to the Buddha. The clouds arise from the ocean of these great beings who see the Buddha. They have seen the, by the power of the Buddha, they see the Buddha. And now these offerings arise from them. And these offerings which arise from them then rain down on them. So the offerings come from the ocean of beings, rise up, and then rain back down on them. Arise from them, rain down on them. This is the environment as described at the end of this first chapter, celebrating and adorning the Buddha. Now, in that situation, where we are making offerings to great perfect enlightenment and being being rained down upon by our own offerings and the offerings of our companions, in that situation is what sets up the next book. And the next book starts out by saying, all these beings in this kind of like generosity weather system, they all have kind of the same thought, which is, as I mentioned, yeah, I mentioned last time, towards the end of last time, I said they they had the same thought. And the thought they had was, uh, in the form of, I said, 21 questions. But... (laughs) One of our members named Mei Chu Chen, Radiant Ocean, she went to the text and she counted and she said there's only 18 questions. She said, sorry, sorry, but sorry, teacher, I think there's 18. She didn't say, she didn't say, you miscounted. She just said, I think there's 18. And then she wrote them out in Chinese. So I, I'm sorry. Last week I said there were 21, but now I think maybe there's just only 18 questions. And who asked these questions? Great Assembly, who asked these 18 questions? Bodhisattvas. Hmm? Not just the Bodhisattvas. The whole Assembly. All the Bodhisattvas and all this other, you know, 57, oh, take away one, 57 varieties of beings. And the Bodhisattvas all had this question, these, these, these 18 questions. And then after these 18 questions come a request. All this, however, is is mental. They're not saying anything yet. This great assembly, this huge assembly, they're all have these questions. Where are these questions arising? In this, you could say, in this generosity storm. But it's a very pleasant storm. So... Generosity, <laughs> atmospheric river of generosity. In that situation, all these beings have questions about, and the questions are about the Buddha. And then after they have these questions in their minds, in their minds, they wish, they wish the Buddha would explain, would respond to their questions. But Buddha's not talking yet. But they want the Buddha to talk. They know how great the Buddha is. And they're making offerings to it. And they want the Buddha to respond to their questions. And then they go on, still in silence, thinking together. Thinking in unison and silence. By the way, are we thinking in unison and silence? (laughs) Are you thinking in unison with everybody? I don't know. Some people say no. One person says, I'm not thinking in unison. <laughs> <laughs> then they go on to, to mention some things that Buddha taught. So they, they heard that Buddha taught about the oceans of beings, oceans of, of bodhisattvas, oceans of Buddhas, oceans of merits. They talk about these oceans that the Buddha spoke of. And then after they list all these oceans of things that the Buddha has spoken of, they again, in their minds, 
wish that the Buddha would tell them more about this stuff that they've heard the Buddha has spoken about. So they've heard the Buddha has spoken. I don't know where they heard it, but the Buddha has not yet spoken in this sutra. But the, the awakening of the Buddha has got all these people thinking these thoughts together. And then the uh, and then the bodhisattvas in the great assembly <laughs> they um, they interact with these questions in such a way that they get these they they now have their um, they have their they interact with these questions and their offerings. So they made these offerings, they have these questions, and then they have made their, their offerings, these oceans of clouds of offerings, they make the offerings talk. And the offerings ask, basically, give 10 verses. And the offerings are basically, again, asking the Buddha to teach, celebrating the Buddha, and asking the Buddha to teach. Okay? That's the beginning of the second book. Get the picture? Huge assembly, getting rained down by their own offerings, giving rise to more, and then this offerings, which they're cranking, they're still cranking away the offerings. The offerings start talking. And what do the offerings say? They say, Buddha's body's like this, Buddha's body's like that. We wish the world honor him would teach us about the world honoring one's body. Okay? So again, that's, we got that far last, in our last meeting. I'm telling the story again so that you eventually will have it in you. I'm not reading this. I, it's in me now, right? So I can tell you this story. You can tell it a different way. But this is a story I'm telling today about the first book and the beginning of the second book, okay? So now, after this is set up, the next thing that happens is Buddha knows what these people are thinking. And part of, you say, well, part of the reason Buddha knows is because all these bodhisattvas got the offerings to, to speak so the Buddha could hear what these people are thinking through their offerings. When you make an offering to somebody, like a Buddha, in a sense, they know something about you, like they might know. This person thinks they're making an offering to me. This person is paying their respects to me. This person is giving me a gift in a very respectful, gentle, kind way. So when we make gifts, people do understand us. But, but not all of our gifts talk. But these people's gifts talk, and they tell Buddha they want the Buddha to speak to them. And so, but the Buddha doesn't speak to them. What does the Buddha do? The Buddha gives light from, one translation is from the teeth. The Buddha gives light. Another one is from the space between the teeth, the Buddha gives light. And this is like a super magnificent light show. It pervades the entire universe in 10 directions. Not to mention this huge assembly here. It pervades all the beings in this assembly, and it also pervades the whole universe beyond this assembly. In all the other oceans of worlds, the light also pervades them and wakes up the people there, the way the pe people here are being awakened. And those people in all those world systems can see the Buddha by this light. So today, I'm talking about this light, this light. What is this light of this sutra? What is the light of the Buddha's body? Well, Buddha's body, right? First verse, <laughs> first verse of the sutra, Buddha's body is light, and this light pervades throughout all the assemblies. It's something that 
pervades all of us. Number two, it's free of any nature and it's ungraspable. So I said, what is this light? Well, I don't know. It's ungraspable. However, even though I don't know, it doesn't stop a dull-witted person talking about it. So what is the light? Well, I would say the light is a transmission. It's a transmission. The light is a conversation. The light is a conversation between the Buddha and this, this immense immense assembly with the Buddha in this particular ocean of worlds. And this particular ocean of worlds in the sutra is the lotus flower treasury of ocean of worlds. The light of the Buddha pervades all the beings in that world and it also pervades the beings in all the other oceans of worlds which have different names. (laughs) <laughs> so there's, there's many oceans of worlds in this sutra and the Buddha's light pervades them all the conversation the conversation between Buddha and all beings and also the conversation between all beings is the light. The conversation between all of our subatomic particles in our body and all the subatomic particles in our body and other bodies, all of our gross, beautiful human bodies are are in conversation with other graspable, graspable human bodies and human bodies that grasp other human bodies, right? Human bodies are into grasping human bodies. Whales have trouble grasping each other a lot of the time. They, they can bump into each other, but they, don't, they have trouble grasping. Humans can grasp each other. and We can even grasp whales, little parts of them. This transmission, this conversation is ungraspable all-pervading and unhindered. We have a text which some of you are familiar with, a Zen classic. It's called Transmission of the Light, and it's about stories of Zen monks and their teachers in conversation with each other. They're, they're, I think the book has like a, maybe... 50, 50, I think maybe 52, yeah, about 52 stories of conversations between Zen student and Zen teacher. 52 conversations between Zen teacher and Zen student. The conversation is the light. And these stories are the transmission of this conversation which is the light of the Buddha's body. That book called Transmission of Light is written by one of our Japanese ancestors, the fourth Japanese ancestor, Keizan Jokin Daiyosho. And there's a Chinese text which has, which has, which is much larger, which has stories about many Chinese teachers and students in conversation. And that text is called in English, the transmission of the lamp, or the transmission of the torch. Zen is about the transmission of light. It's about the transmission of the conversation of Buddha with all beings and all beings with Buddha. 
and all beings with each other. This sutra is kind of funny in a way. So, okay, so the light's coming. Here comes the light from the Buddha, from the teeth or between the teeth. Here comes the light. What is this light? This light is the conversation between Buddha and all beings, and this light pervades all beings throughout the universe. And here's the part I laughed at, is now the light starts talking. The light talks. It doesn't say the Buddha talks, it says the light talks, and the light talks by giving, I think, probably 10 verses. And these verses, again, just tell people who are seeing the light, they're seeing the light, and now they're hearing the light talk to them. And what does the light say? Well, it, it reiterates the magnificence of awakening. It says again, the radiance of Zen practice. And it also says, by the way, it would be a good idea if you went to see the Buddha and see what the Buddha has to say. Buddha hasn't said anything yet, but it would be good for you to go and hang out with the Buddha and see if Buddha does have something to say. And it says that over and over. Go to the, the Buddha. The Buddha's there. He, he's in that world. You can go there and, and listen to the Buddha and see the Buddha and receive the teaching and ask Buddha. You know. So the light of Buddha sends out this illumination to all these beings and wakes them up. But then after it wakes them up, it says, and by the way, you can actually go now and hang out with the Buddha and you know, get more instruction on this light. Knock on 1881A. Yeah, 1881A, right. 1881A. Yeah, 1881A. I see a hand raised. I just want to say one more thing before we... Before we what? have another form of conversation? Actually, you started already. It's okay. It's okay. It's all right. 1881A. <laughs> so, the, um, there was, there, then there is a response to this light. Okay, this light is calling. This light is illuminating, but it's also calling. It's an illumination that calls. And it's an illumination that came in response to a call, right? What was the call? What was the call that this response is coming from? Offerings. The offerings were a call, and what else? Light. Hmm? Light? No, they, no. Questions. Hmm? Yeah, all these questions. But more than that, they also said, we, we, we only ask that the Buddha will respond. So there is a response. There is a request, there is a call, and the Buddha is responding, right? There's a conversation between this immense body of beings in this world begging the Buddha to teach. And now the Buddha knows that, so the Buddha teaches by giving this light. And in the light, the Buddha, through light, the Buddha issues a great invitation. The people who are present, they're already there, He's inviting the people throughout the rest of the universe to all come. So the, the Buddha's light is a request. The Buddha's radiance is a request. It's a request for us to come and ask questions. <laughs> the Buddha's light is a conversation, and the conversation is a, a call and a response, a request and a listening, a crying we only wish, and a response, light. And the light says, come. And then the next big section of chapter, book, book two is 
a picture, a story about the coming of the beings throughout the universe. They all, they all come from ten directions, these beings come. Okay? So that sets the table for light. And, and, we ha- and, and even before I said it's time to eat, Suchitra offered some conversation. <laughs> You're being asked to do it. You did it before you were asked. It's okay. What about the ten verses you were talking about? Pardon? You were talking about the ten verses. The light has ten verses in it. Are you going to tell us what they are? Well, I could, I could do it. I could do it very easily, yeah. Because I, I have not, I have not memorized these ten verses that are in the Buddha's light. So the the offerings that are made by this vast assembly, they they make a request. They make a request. They vocalize the wish that the Buddha will teach, and there's ten of them. And the last line of the last of the ten requests that are, that they don't they don't speak with their lips. The requests are made by the offerings. The clouds of offerings are making requests. The last line of the tenth verse of the request is, "Please expound this awakening sight." Please expound. No, please expound at this awakening sight. So all these beings are at the awakening site of the Buddha, and their offerings beg the Buddha to expound. And there's ten verses like that, and then the Buddha gives the light, and then the light makes as a ten-verse invitation to the whole universe to come to this assembly. And the, the ten verses of the that are in the light. <laughs> yeah, so. Those lights, in the presence of all those bodhisattvas, interred verses. This is written on page 152 of Cleary's translation. What's written there? Ten verses coming from these lights in, that are occurring in these bodhisattva assemblies. And if you want to, I could read you the ten verses, but I think right now you probably are pretty full. Mm -hmm. But there are ten verses that are the the light, the Buddha's light talking. Which again, there's some principle there, which is when the Buddha sends a light to all beings, the light is an invitation. The light is a call. And then there's a response to this, to the light. Amanda? Um, I'm kind of thinking that I have a connection that's coming with me, and, and maybe it is also a question. And the connection is uh, about a sangha. The, the about, connection is about? Uh, a sangha, and a sangha's journey, um, and a sangha's. Um, practice and offerings and calling through offerings of going to sit um, and asking to see my Buddha and becoming discouraged and then taking another journey where he's having different interactions with, with beings where he finally comes to a dog who is in pain and needs attention and he offers himself to the situation. And in that offering, there's a great burst of light that happens. And the light does speak, because uh, my um, Asana sees the light, um, which is like he's been asking for for many, many years, and making an effort for many years also. which is like the dog, into town, but people might 
might not see the light. They might just see the dog. And um, I guess there's, you know, two things. One is, well, it's just, it's one thing. What is the effort involved with discovering or opening and, opening realizing. and realizing the light? What is the effort? Well, one, first of all, thank you for this story. It's a great story for this situation. Uh, I don't know if you followed it. I'll tell it again to help you. But that's a great story to bring up. It's very much about this. It's about this same light. Okay. So... Um, now I'll tell the story again. Once upon a time, I, in India, I heard I heard that once upon a time in India, there was a great bodhisattva, and this bodhisattva's name was Asanga, which kind of like sounds like Asanga. <laughs> anyway, he was a great bodhisattva. I, you know, I, I just I could, I could go on for thousands of pages writing verses about how great he was, but I'm not going to do it today. <laughs> and he, uh, yeah, he was there. He was there, I think, maybe in Southeast Asia, not quite in India at this time. Anyway, he was traveling around as a bodhisattva, and he thought, he had this thought, you know, <sighs> people are trying to practice the Buddha way, but we need some more help. And the help he thought we needed was for Maitreya. And Maitreya means loving kindness. For Maitreya Bodhisattva, who's the next Buddha, we need Maitreya to come and help us in this world. We need the Bodhisattva, the future Buddha, Maitreya, we need him to come. That's what this great Bodhisattva thought. So he... So he like, wanted to devote himself to a massive invitational process. He, want, he wanted to get, he wanted to ask, he wanted to have a conversation with this magnificent, ungraspable spirit of loving kindness who will become a Buddha later. But he didn't want to wait for the Buddha to come later. He wanted the Buddha like soon, like today, or tomorrow, or the next day, or the next day, or the next day. But anyway, he wanted the Buddha as soon as possible to come and help this world practice the Bodhisattva way. So he went into on a retreat, I think into a cave, and he just like extended offerings and invitations to Maitreya Buddha. And he did it, in one version of the story, he did it for four years, and Maitreya did not come, did not appear to Maitreya. And he said, okay, I give up. <laughs> Excuse me for laughing. At the great Bodhisattva, the great Bodhisattva giving up. And then he left the cave and he was like, I don't know where he was going. I forgot where he was going. And I don't think we know where he was going. But anyway, he ran into somebody who was making a really great effort. Just somebody on the road, you know, was doing something like trying to move a mountain, you know, stone by stone. And he was inspired. And he went back to the cave. And he, did, he re he refreshed his invitation process to Maitreya. And he did it for four more years. And Maitreya did not come. And he quit again. <laughs> and again, he left the cave and he ran into somebody else on another road doing some incredibly wholehearted thing even though it was, like, impossible what the person was trying to do. 
So he, again, he was re-inspired, and he went back to the cave. <laughs> and then four more years, and Maitreya did not come. And he gave up again. And this time he didn't run into... He, he, he didn't run in, in, into anybody who inspired him to go back to the cave. However, he did run into a very sick puppy. Not a puppy. Very sick dog. Who was like, uh, yeah, had lots of, lots of sores and wounds and the sores and the wounds were infested with maggots. Now, he didn't know at the time that maggots actually clean wounds they're not bad things if you have a wound. They clean it. He didn't know that. He thought it would be helpful to the... He wanted to help the... He wanted to help the dog. And he thought it would be helpful to the dog if he would remove the maggots from the dog's wounds. No. Brackets. Hint. What's he doing? He's not just, he's not just inviting Maitreya to come. He's taking care of a sick dog. And then he thinks, it would be good to remove the maggots, but I don't want to hurt the maggots. Hint, he's concerned with maggots now. So in order to not hurt the maggots, in order to help the dog, he uses his tongue to remove the maggots. He gets in there. His compassion goes right down to... Maggot licking compassion <laughs> in in the putrid wounds of the dog. He gets in there. He's not. He still wants Maitreya to come, but it's not just oh Buddha come in. It's like it's now get into the mud. And then something happens. I don't know exactly how it goes, but to make a long story short, the dog kind of turns into this radiant light, but it's like a sphere of light. It's a, it's a radiance, but it's somewhat sort of like in a spherical form. The dog becomes this sphere of radiance and love. Maitreya Buddha has finally come. He's been inviting him, but now he's actually done what was missing. And he said, why didn't you come earlier? I've been begging you to come for 12 years. And Maitreya says, because until now you were not, you are not, there wasn't enough loving kindness in compassion in your practice. But now it's there, baby, and I'm here with you. And I've been with you the whole time. I've been, I've, I've been like sitting on top of your head all these years but you didn't see me because you weren't taking care of maggots or whatever. But now you are, so now you see me. This is good, right? Yes, this is good. But still, I, you know, I see you, but can't everybody see you now? You had trouble with that part. I said, no, only those who are as compassionate as you can see me. And so, I said, take me into town, show me to people, see if they've seen me. So he took this Maitreya with him into town and showed people to Maitreya, but all they saw was a sick dog. And maybe right now, I'm showing you this, this sphere of light and all you're seeing is a sick dog, a dumb Zen priest. I don't know what you're seeing, but anyway, the point is, that's a very good story about this process. about the conversation. So, again, the conversation doesn't... There's no limits on what it can be, but it's not necessarily what we think it should be. So he made his offerings, he tried to have a conversation with Maitreya, and he was in conversation with Maitreya. He was working with Maitreya all that time. But his practice hadn't quite reached maturity where he was ready to... see Maitreya. But then it did. 
the great Bodhisattva, even though he was great when he started, he was more mature at the end, and so he could have this relationship. But he also could see that other people cannot see this unless they have the same practice. So he endeavored, gave his life to encouraging others. Now with the inspiration of Maitreya, Maitreya is like really making it possible for him to work in this difficult world. And he does work in this difficult world. And he gives us these amazing gifts. He wrote five, five great treatises, which are said to be kind of inspired by Maitreya. Conversation. This is the light. Conversation. So we make our offerings, and we make our offerings, and we make our offerings. We request the teaching, we request the teaching. This is the process. Okay. Well. Uh, yes. Holly. Hey I have a question about an earlier story of the blues. Yes. Buddha is sitting under the Bodhi tree and he, he about to become enlightened. Mm-hmm. And so some part of the story goes that Mara shows up and mm-hmm. tempts the Buddha in all these various ways. Mm-hmm. And the Buddha is asked some kind of question from Mara by what right or some question like this, by what right is it of yours to become enlightened? And the Buddha puts his hand on the earth and says, the earth is my witness. Something like this. Mm-hmm. This is a version mm-hmm. of the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thus I have heard. <laughs> yeah. So my question is this. Well, can I, this, is, this story is, is, is a great story. And it's not in the canon. I know. It's a legend. But let me finish the story, which is, let me call the earth to witness my effort. And when he touches the earth, the earth roared the earth to affirm his right to awakening. Yeah, I don't Conversation. Know. The earth roar, okay, roars. Wait. Yes, yes. We support you. Okay. In that moment... Is that when he becomes enlightened? And, or is Not he quite. enlightened before he touches the earth? And the next question is, does he defeat Mara all at once? He doesn't, well, I don't think he defeats Mara. I think he has a conversation with Mara. So Mara is not done with, after all of that. Mara is not. <laughs> I would say Mara is not done, and we can talk about that later. Okay. But for now, let's focus on this story, because you said, was he enlightened when he called the earth to witness? that he had the right to sit there. And I would say, not yet. Because th- the story goes on that the point of the story was he was not going to move until he realized the way. And then these various challenges to his immovable commitment came to him. And the one that was most difficult for him was when his egotism was called into question, or his, he, he was called into question about whether he might be egotistical about this attainment. So these forces were trying to get him to move from his site of awakening, but he had not yet awakened. After he settled, then the awakening occurred. So by the time he touches the earth, he's already become awakened? No. no. He's asked... He, he, Mara is still trying to you know, get him to move. Right. So after, after he calls uh, the earth to witness, and the earth tells him and Mara, we support this guy to not move, Mara backs off. But Mara will come back later okay. for more, more conversations. Mm-hmm. I would say basically, for me, there. for me, Mara is continuing to be available for conversation. <laughs> and conversation with Mara... We don't do by ourselves. We do it with the whole universe. And we, and we need conversations with Mara to test our resolve to the practice and sit still here. And, and we have plenty of, plenty of tests, don't we? Plenty of Maras are saying to us, you can't be still. 
So the time that Buddha touches the earth, he's still not awakened. He's right. In this story, which is not in the... He awakens after going through the night. And lots of things happen as it goes through the light, night. But in the morning, either one day later after Mara leaves or quite a few days later, during some night, the Buddha goes through a lot of realizations and finally realizes the way together with all beings, which is happening at the first moment of the sutra. Buddha has just awakened under the Bodhi tree. But the, the Buddha that's awakened here is the, the Vairochana, the Dharma body of the Buddha is awakening in this story. Not the transformation body of the historical human. But the same picture, just on a much greater scale, is here. And then later in the sutra, the Buddha speaks and says, I did wake up, to, but I woke up together with all beings, not just by myself. That's why the earth supports us to practice, not just for us to become Buddha, but for the whole world to attain Buddhahood together. But that story is another example. It's, although it's not in the canon, it's another story of conversation. It's another story of the light. But it somehow didn't, it hasn't been able to get into the canonical stories of the Buddha. But it seems, it's, it's totally included in the, con, in the canon. You just can't see it until you're devoted to the canon. And then when you see it, you see it popping out of every particle of the canon. Deborah, thank you for that question. That's a really good one. Um, I think you said Buddha's body fills the Dharma realm free of nature, including Buddha nature. What's the difference between Buddha's body and the light and Buddha nature? Well, Buddha nature, you could see, is something uh, that we will want to talk about meditating on the nature of Buddha in order to see the, um, the womb body of the Buddha, or the seed body of the Buddha. So, um, yeah, so in the next, after we're in chapter 2 now, in chapter 3 we have a description of the prototypic bodhisattva meditation of this sutra, which is the meditation of the bodhisattva Samantabhadra, the bodhisattva universal goodness. That bodhisattva is in a samadhi, and the samadhi is called the illumination, you could say, of Buddha nature. Or, but it literally says the illumination of the womb of the thus come one. That's, that's the um, samadhi of this bodhisattva. This bodhisattva is concentrating on the, the place the womb, where the Tathagata, which is the Tathagata's body, which is the thus come one's body. And that body is illuminated by the Buddha's light. And in illuminating the Buddha nature, we're free of Buddha nature too. We don't, we, there's no clinging to the womb body of the Tathagata. Even though there is kind of a womb body, to meditate on. And that's that described in the next chapter at the beginning of the Bodhisattva entering that samadhi, which is called sometimes called universal goodness is samadhi, but it's actually in the text is called it's called absorption or concentration on the womb body of the Tathagata, which all Buddhas possess and which is illuminated by the Bodhi, the Buddha of universal light, by Vachana. And that's the Buddha's body, illuminated and not, but not, but ungraspable. So again, the first verse of the Sutra kind of is in that in that the core of that samadhi at the beginning of the third chapter.
which is the Bodhisattva Samadhi, which I would say is Zazen practice. And then it goes through in that chapter describing all the qualities of this Samadhi, of this concentration. And it says, it, blah, 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 it, blah, blah, blah. So when I read it, I'm, Zazen, blah, 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 Zazen, blah, 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 Zazen, blah, blah. In other words, this Samadhi of this great Bodhisattva is describing the magnificence and depth of our sitting. And this depth is, is fathomable, cannot be fathomed, cannot be grasped. That's, that's what we're really doing. Okay? Catherine? Maybe you just said this, but um, so my emphasis on light is showing that it's beyond words. Um, the teaching is beyond words. It's beyond words, yeah. And words are going on here. The, te- the, the Buddha's light is beyond words, and it can talk. What is beyond words can talk. In, in one of our other samadhis, the precious mirror samadhi, it said, although it's not fabricated, it can talk. Words can't reach it. It's beyond words, but it can talk. So Buddha is beyond words, is ungraspable, and the ungraspable can talk. And it also can give off light. But the light it gives off, and the talk it gives off, are conversation pieces. All the things the Buddha said are conversation pieces. And the conversation, which the Buddha's words are fostering, the conversation is the light. And you can't grasp a conversation... <laughs> A conversation is ungraspable. A conversation is quiet. So people are... Okay? People are talking and people are listening, right? That's part of what happens in conversations. But sometimes conversations, there's nobody talking. It's just light shining at light. It's just offerings in silence being received. And, you know, the conversation is the Buddha, is the light. And it's quiet. Conversation is quiet. Conversation doesn't stop when the people talking to each other are quiet. It doesn't start when they start talking again. It's going on all the time. The conversation, the light, is pervading every moment of our life. And it's beyond words. It's a feeling that's a conversation. It's a feeling that, yeah, it's a feeling, it's a feeling, but you can't grasp it. And because you can't grasp it, this feeling pervades everywhere. The feeling, it, you know, you may talk about the feeling, but the feeling is not talking. The feeling is silent, free of, the, of, free of feeling. It's a feeling that's free of feeling that cannot be grasped. You can make conversation into a feeling. You can make it into an emotion. It can be anything, but it's, it's, it's anything that's not existing by itself, but only in a conversation. It's a conversation. Yes? And it uh, doesn't have to be with another person. It can be with anything, right? It can be with anything. Zikurashi was big with having conversations with rocks. <laughs> He thought he's, he's okay talking to people, too. Everything is all, all the, all, all the atomic, molecular, biological, subatomic, all the phenomena of the universe are interpenetrating each other. And each phenomena includes innumerable Buddhas with innumerable Bodhisattvas. That's what this sutra is about. There's other sutras which talk differently. <laughs> but this sutra is everything. It's in, every particle includes infinite, uncountable Buddha lands. And in each Buddha land, 
there are a Buddha and a great assembly who are in conversation. So this particle includes lands of light where the conversations are radiant. And also the radiance penetrates every, same thing, penetrates every particle of phenomenal life. So that's why when we sit wholeheartedly, the whole phenomenal world becomes enlightenment. Yes? So as I've seen in books, it appears to me that the nature of... Could you stand up, please, and say it? It appears to me that the nature of infiniteness is that's what makes it ungraspable. Because in it, by nature, it's infinite, and infinite is ungraspable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Infinity is ungraspable. Now you could say, well, what about like rational infinities, like the number of rational numbers? That's a smaller infinity than, for example, all the irrational numbers too. But I'm the full scale, uncountable, innumerable. And there's countable infinities, but the innumerable infinity is ungraspable. Our practice is ungraspable. And the Buddha's body is that ungraspable. So being devoted to Buddha's body is being devoted to something that we can't get a hold of. But also, the same reason why we can't get a hold of it is also why we can't get away from it. There's nothing you can never get away from something that's ungraspable. (laughs) And we are also calling for this ungraspable Buddha body to come and have a conversation with us, whether we know it or not. We are bodhisattvas, requesting conversation with an ungraspable light, which, and the conversation is what liberates beings from suffering. And again, this teaching is something which probably need to keep in touch with whether it's being requested or not. And one more thing that comes to my mind is that Sikrishi sometimes talked about how our practice is like, our normal practice is like light, Um, excuse me, like a form, it's a form, but this form of our practice needs emptiness, which is like salt. So our practice, which is like rice, It really tastes good with a little bit of emptiness salt. But he also cautioned not to put too much salt on it. So I might have put too much salt on today. (laughs) (laughs) So I have to be careful. Because, you know, that can ruin, that that can make the rice almost uneatable. And again, you don't have to necessarily have rice on your, salt on your rice. And as you also don't necessarily have rice on your salt. But rice doesn't have, doesn't necessarily require it unless you want to really, really taste good. So a little bit of salt, a little bit of the inconceivable, a little bit of the ungraspable makes this graspable practice, this sitting, 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 a little bit of, of a tamsaka with the, <laughs> makes us more enthusiastic about this potentially boring, simple practice. <laughs> we need to hear a little bit about how great it is in order to wholeheartedly give it to those two. So that's that this is for. Was there anything else before lunch? Yes. So um, even though this is ungraspable, yeah. can you know it? Can you know it? Well, you can't know it as a graspable thing. Like, do like, you think you know what day it is? I think I do. Yeah, what do you think? It's, think it's Saturday? Yeah, so that seems to be graspable, right? That kind of knowing doesn't apply to this. But, you, but, you, but whether you know it or not, you are it. And you can realize that by the way you 
live your life. Yeah. That yeah. works. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's how it works. It works through our everyday, each moment of activity, like your question, my response, that conversation realizes this ungraspable thing. Neither one of us can get a hold of this conversation. Neither one of us is in charge of it. Yeah. Yeah. We can realize the in, the ungraspable, quiet Buddha body. The sutra is about helping us realize it in every little particle of our life. Yeah, so we could have we could have some particles of lunch now. <laughs>